At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. By the age of 13, more than 70% of kids dropped out of organized sports because it's just not fun anymore. Outrageous behavior in youth sports amongst fans and even the players themselves is highlighted regularly on popular media. Does the idea of good sportsmanship not exist in some places, or are we just more aware of a behavior that has always been a part of youth sports? Joining us today to discuss youth sports and what parents and coaches are doing right and wrong are Kelly Jackson, president of All-American Softball and the author of Bats, Gloves, and Glitter, Seven Must-Know Facts About Female Athletes, and Bill Horenda, executive director of the po Positive Coaching Alliance of Sacramento. Kelly, Bill, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be here, Scott. So how did youth sports become such a grim business? The pressure of a college scholarship, I believe. Really? That's what I think. And so, have we just professionalized youth sports where, where I mean, literally, it's like pro sports? Well, I, I think college and pro sports are a business and they're, it's entertainment. And I think that mentality has seeped down into youth sports and we're missing uh, the rife opportunities for character development, which really is what youth sports should be about. And don't get me wrong, I love professional sports, I love college sports, but there it's more about entertainment. I think that win at all cost mentality has seeped down into the youth level. And of course, the Positive Coaching Alliance, we're, we're not saying they're mutually exclusive, but we're saying, hey, at this level, this should be about better athletes and better people and de developing major league people for the long term. But Kelly, I gotta ask the question, are we getting upset about something that's always been a part of youth sports? I mean, bad parents and, 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 and you know, crazy coaches and things like that. Isn't that as all-American as apple pie and hot dogs? Well, I think it is. I don't think parents or coaches have really changed that much. I think there's more media So they were always rotten? They're always crazy, yeah. <laughs> I think there's more media showing what they're doing and there's there's a lot more awareness to their behavior and people want their kids treated a certain way so so the people are asking coaches or they're demanding coaches to treat their kid a certain way and then parents have an idea what they want their kid to be they have an expectation for their child to have a college scholarship so I just feel like there's this whole great big business around the kids as opposed to it being a part of a community and the athlete really enjoying what they're doing and, and so, uh, Bill, there's a, there is a notion going on in this country that we're too soft on our kids anyway. And so there's this conflict, which is that you look at YouTube or, you know, anything on the Internet, and it shows all of these bad incidences of, you know, unsportsmanlike conduct. At the same time, you know, in our self-esteem age, everyone's a winner, right? And so what, how is it that we reconcile, one, this grim competitiveness that seems to be, you know, at the root of making kids unhappy, but at the same time, we also are saying, well, it doesn't matter how you do and you don't have to compete because we're all great. Well, we are all great, Scott. We know that, <laughs> present company, of course, included. However, I, I will say this. Uh, Essentially, what we're talking about is kids learning how to develop into responsible, independent, confident adults. And you've got to recognize where your strengths are. And Charlie Wiedemeyer, the great uh, late uh, football coach at Los Gatos High School, said, high school teaches you what life is going to be like. Athletics teaches you what life is. So kids have to learn how to succeed, do it with dignity, do it with class. They also have to learn how to fail. You're not always gonna get into the school you want. You're not gonna get the job you want. You're not gonna see eye to eye with every professor or every boss. So they have to learn how to do that. And, and again, 
Our National Advisory Board with guys like Ronnie Lott, gals like Brandy Chastain, Doc Rivers, Lionel Hollins, Dusty Baker, the list goes on and on. These are fierce competitors. Uh, you know, Kelly, I'm sure, you know, we wouldn't be in athletics if we were not competitive, highly driven. Those goals of winning and character development are not mutually exclusive. I think they can coexist. But are we, te are we teaching kids to compete these days when all we do is give out trophies to everybody? No. We're not teaching them. We, we take the competitiveness out of it because everything they do is good. Well, it's not. If you strike out, it really isn't good. So come in the dugout and to be told how great you are, it's not reality. And I think that that works into their working world when they get older. If, if reality is everything they do is great, they're not going to respond to having a boss or having direction or being able Your to... Your boss is not going to give you a flower every day just no. for showing up. <laughs> no, <laughs> Yeah, and showing up a few minutes late. You know, you, you just... We, the parents are enabling their kids to not have to learn and not have to follow through with what they need to follow through with. If they want to quit a team, they can just quit a team. If they feel like they've been done wrong, that's okay. You can... You've been done wrong, let's move on. And kids need to know that they have to finish things. They need to know that they have to work through, I think... Uh, you know, work through the hard things and, and learn from mistakes. I use a lot of negative things that kids are doing in sports to help them advance in their, in their development. So, okay, you don't like that, so make that a positive for yourself. How are you going to handle that if it happens to you in a job? Or how are you going to handle that if it happens to you in college? So they have to learn, but I'm, I'm in a private setting teaching them and, and I get to be one-on-one -on -one with them and their parents aren't there. When it gets really bad, I bring a parent in and I go, okay, this is what's happening and you're saying that, that she can quit and I'm saying she has to continue so, so she can learn how to get through this. Now, that's, that sounds contrary to a line that I just heard recently about some coach said that he wanted to coach a, a team full of orphans because they didn't have any parents. <laughs> so, so are the parents part of the solution as well in terms of making sports more enjoyable for our young people? Well, well we, we found at the Positive Coaching Alliance that we've got to touch each constituency. So we have workshops. Describe them. Describe yeah, so, them. We, so we have uh, workshops for coaches. Our paradigm is a double goal coach. First goal is to win. The second more important goal is to teach life lessons. For the parents, second goal parent. That's what you should aspire to. There you're reinforcing the life lessons. You're not second guessing the coaches and uh, acting as a deterrent on the car ride home, et cetera. And then for the student athletes, we're talking about being a triple impact competitor, making yourself, your teammates, and the game overall better. And we also have workshops for leaders within an athletic department or within a board of a, of a league, whether it's a little league, soccer, it's, et cetera. So with that said, where's their fun? That's what parents want them to have. They want them to have fun. So where's the, you know, the, I, I, so I totally agree with what you're saying, but, but so here's one, one, one quick example, Kelly, is in our workshops for parents, for example, we talk about why do you have your kids in athletics in the first place? Is it physical fitness? Is it, f it just to simply have fun and interact with their peers? Is it about learning teamwork, leadership skills, confidence, or is it a college scholarship? So people may feel reluctant to admit that, that I've got my kid here to get through college. That's why they may be reluctant to admit that publicly, but at least that's something that we Isn't can Isn't that plan. an unrealistic goal? Well, Scott, parents? here's what, here's what I, you know, people say it all the time. I, I, get, I get angry when I hear people talk about numbers because, oh, well, you know, the percentage of kids that play in college or play professional. Listen, we're not putting a ceiling. I would never put a ceiling on any kid and what they can do. Uh, you know, certainly having played college basketball, I, you know, looks can be deceiving. I mean, you know, my game was not that good, <laughs> but I was able to do that through a lot of hard work and a lot of people, a lot of help along the way. So, I, I, again, don't pursue your dreams. Work as hard as possible. And, again, it's those skills that are going to propel you to great things in life, not just on the field. And, Kelly, to finish up with your point, I, I agree. The whole thing should be about fun and certainly – I think, Scott, you mentioned it earlier that uh, coaches have always been mean. I think in our generation, uh, yeah, it was when you were playing college basketball, there was a scandal at Rutgers, you were at the mercy of your coaches because they, they controlled the steering wheel, playing time, all of those things. But, but, but these coaches, you know, coaches being mean, we're going to work for and with people that are mean. Right, so right. So what I'm trying to get at is where's the balance at? Because... On the one hand, you want to create a positive environment and, and create it such so that there's not a 
percent drop off rate. Balance is within their family. It's in their w w what their family unit expects them to do. And I think what what we do best, or what I like w that we do, is we take the kid to their next level. So if they're in rec ball and they want to play high school ball, then we teach them how to play. We, we give them the skills, teach them the skills to play high school ball. And you know, I've been in business 19 years, and pretty much that has kept me in business, to teach them that next step as opposed to teach them to get a college scholarship. Give us a sense of the, of the, the characteristics of the kids, the girls that you're dealing with that drive you crazy, that you're hoping that you can help sort of work out of them over time as you work with them? Probably the, the athlete that bothers me the most is an athlete that has a lot of talent but doesn't want to work hard to get that step further. They, they can play Division I softball, but they really don't want to put the work ethic in. The other athletes, really, I don't ever get irritated with an athlete. I get irritated with what the parent's teaching the athlete. So I have to work in and out of parent dynamic, a family dynamic, a softball dynamic, a team coach. So there's all kinds of dynamics that I work in and out of that are there because of the family structure. Is that more of a generational entitlement mentality I issue? I believe or? it is. Yeah, really? I think it is. I think that our kids, I mean, I, we, you know, I, I, being asked why I do this, I, it's, it's because why I love it. Why do you do this? I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do it because I love it. And uh -huh. I want kids to have the same thing that I had, and I want them to have something of their own. Mm -hmm. I think that athletics develop something of your own. You know, it's, it, you're good at it, you get to have it, and it's, not, it's something that no one can take from you. But it's um, when I try to deal with people to get them to understand that, that they're not always going to win or they're not always going to feel good after a ball game, I really have to educate parents. And when I was growing up, if I did well, then I got praised. If I didn't do well, I heard about it. And I think that our kids need to hear a little bit more reality than they do now. And, you know, we deal with female athletes, so we're, we're a lot more sensitive. We like to fit in and look good, and, you know, so mm -hmm. dads don't really understand that. Dads want us to go all out all the time, and we're just, for, we're, sometimes we settle How is coaching girls different than coaching boys? What's Oh, whoa. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm curious it's, it's because... It's hugely different. Really? Oh, it's so different. We have just a different thought process. We're mm -hmm. more sensitive. We, we have different things that we like. Fit in, look good. Those are all important to us. What color we're wearing. So the sport is really important, but we have some other dynamics. So if you tell us that you want us to do something, we're okay with doing it. But if you belittle us and tell us, then we just give up. Most, most really? female athletes give up. Really? Yeah, and, and we're working, 95% of female athletes work the same way. There are a few of us out there that are aggressive, and if you tell me to do something hard, you know, do something better, I'll go, okay, I'll do that better. But most female athletes go, oh, you don't like me, and, they, and we take a step back. Bill, you know, I know that youth sports is about the kids, but really it seems like 90% of the conversation where things need to be fixed is about the parents. <laughs> and I, I just get share with both of you a quick story. I was at a soccer game and a young 14 year old uh, player was acting as a, a ref and she made a call and two parents surrounded her and cursed her out. And so finally the coaches and some parents came over and essentially intervened. But that young woman it must have been terrifying for her. And the fact that that type of behavior goes on, what does PCA do in terms of helping to address that? Yeah, it's a huge issue and it's awful. Uh, and, you know, essentially, we define culture as the way we do things here. And we're looked at as a, uh, you know, we're a nationwide nonprofit that's reached over a million kids last year alone. So we're, we are in the trenches with schools and leagues all the time. And essentially, teams now at the youth level have a team parent, whether it's a team mom, a team dad, and it's essential that the leadership within that league start off and set the tone of how they're going to act. And we're gonna act with dignity, with respect, we're gonna act with class, we're gonna embrace our opponents, we're gonna be fierce and friendly, and we talk a lot about honoring the roots of the game, rules, officials, opponents, teammates, and self. And officials are a huge right. part get, of that. Get, but, but respond to the specific situation that I presented. If either one of you yeah. had been in that situation, what are the tools that the, that 
the parents should know? Or how, how do you address this? So, so there, and there are no guarantees here. Everything's off the table because you could easily end up on the six o'clock news. Okay, I'm not. We would, I would never say that this is a safe option, but essentially, you should have parents that you trust that are going to step up. And Jim Thompson, in his latest book, uh, Elevating Your Game, talks about moral courage, stepping up when others and even those closest to you won't or don't agree with you. And you've got to shut it down, simply. We just don't do things like that here. And now, again, that could explode. That could be incendiary. But you've got to have the moral courage to step up. That's just not right. Kelly, does right that stuff do. happen in softball? It happens all the time in softball. We have youth umpires, and parents feel like they can belittle them and, and make them change their call because they're, they're intimidating them. So what do you do? Well, if it's a volatile situation, we call the police. I mean, there's no, you know, if a parent's really acting out and they, they need to be brought back, I don't think it's another parent or my responsibility to take care of them. When I was a junior Olympic commissioner, we had a, a situation and a parent got really mad at me because I couldn't control this coach. And it, w it, wasn't, it wasn't a situation that I could control. It was a situation that the law needed to control. So people put a lot of responsibility on people that are there and you, you just have to learn to behave. I mean, I have coaches, I, we have, All American has a coach division, and I have parents that get mad at my coaches and they'll call me, and the first thing they say is, hey, I really want to apologize for my own behavior. I did go off on your coach, and I did cuss him out in the, in the parking lot, but you know, he made me mad earlier than that. And, and my immediate response to that parent is, your poor daughter. You had to really humiliate your daughter in, with your behavior that way. And, you know, and then they step back. Well, well, yeah, but I was mad. Well, it doesn't matter. That's your daughter's sport. She's 12 years old, and it's really sad you behave that way. And, you know, it, to get parents to behave is, is really becoming a huge issue in, in athletics. I mean, Yeah, and, it's, and we talk a lot in our workshops about a self-control routine, that you're prepared as a parent, as a player, as a coach, that – you know, it's a big game. It's a rivalry. There's a lot at stake. You've got to take. You've got to check yourself. You've got to be mentally prepared to put yourself in that position. Visualization before it happens, so that you conduct yourself uh, in, in an appropriate, uh, professional manner. Because of course, it, it, parents and coaches have a prodigious impact. I think as a coach. Uh, as a parent, sometimes you don't realize how malleable these kids are sure. and how they look up to you. So it's really paramount that we strive to act. And it's not always easy. It's, it's not. Uh, but we, we, we've got to strive to, to take the high road and, and do the right thing. It, it, you know, in many ways, it's, it's simple. Uh, like Yogi Berra, baseball is a simple game but difficult to execute. And I, th I think in this case, it really is true. So let me, let me give you another scenario. Uh, there are some coaches who say, listen, drop your kids off leave and we'll return them to you and they'll be just fine. Right. On the other hand, you're, you're asking us parents to drop off our kids and leave them with you. What are the warning signs, if we were to follow that advice, what are the, some of the warning signs that you can offer to let us know that there might be a problem because we might let something go with a bad coach that right. goes way on too long. Well, there, there's, you have to really know the coach before you do that. I always tell parents, let a coach do to your child what you would do. And if they're going further, and, and most of the time of this is yelling at them, if, they, if you don't yell at your child like that, don't let the coach. And, you know, we were in a situation several years back where my kids were playing and, and they had a, an aggressive coach, and they said, I don't treat my kids that way. So I don't want you to treat them that way. And then the, uh, the, we had a, a coach that was coaching an older team, and most of his kids got scholarships. But he was really verbally abusive to those kids. And so I'd tell him, do you treat your kid that way? No, I don't. I don't, you know, that's not how we work in our home. Don't allow the coach to do that. So I feel like, again, parents have to set boundaries and then they have to follow those boundaries when they get to the ball field. And, and, and the type of training that PCA does, what is it specifically? If you're, let's say that you're a young parent and you're just starting to get your kids involved before the 70% drop off rate has happened. What do you suggest? Give, give us kind of a, a, a rules of the road in terms of what we should be doing. Yeah, I, I think as a parent, uh, you should listen to your kids. I think you should let it be their thing. It's really a, a hands-off situation at that point. Let the, it's simple. Let the kids play. Let the coaches coach and just be there to support them. Uh, I mean, it, it's, to me, it's, it's not, uh, especially at that stage of the game where you're talking about, you know, before the drop-off rate of 13, talking about young kids in grammar school, 
just let them have fun. Let them try different sports, particularly at that age in this era of specialization. See what they like. You know, listen, encourage them, and, and, and let them go for it. Listening is a huge deal, especially when a parent is coaching their child. They don't listen. So when you know we get in situations, and again, we're, I'm training the athlete, and I hear the athlete's complaint about her parent slash coach, and I bring the parent in, and I go, okay, now just sit here and listen. Have you heard this before? And always they tell me, no, I didn't know that that's how she was feeling. Wow. So it's listening. And, and I think that that a lot has to do with a male coach versus a female athlete because the athlete does need to be listened to. And really when she's saying something, she means it or it's, it's important to her. Can you explain that uh, again? A male coach versus a female athlete, uh, how does that play in? So most male coaches are aggressive and they want things done immediate and they just want to give direction. They don't want to give any, any pre-direction or they want to, you know, hey, you struck out, I want you to watch the ball. They don't, they're not, don't strike out again is what a male coach will say to a female athlete. And really what a female athlete needs when she walks in the dugout is, hey, why don't you watch the ball all the way in. So it's different teaching that males, they were taught that way and they were taught aggressive that female athletes don't respond That's at all. Interesting. We that, shut I mean, down, we, okay. yeah, we just basically shut down. It's, it's okay, yeah. well, I'm not good enough for and you. That's why I think co coaching is a high energy business. And I don't mean like kinetic, frenetic. It takes a lot of effort to really listen to your players. And to, you know, we talk at, at PCA about uh, an emotional tank. With, with your place, where are you with the, with the emotional thing with each one of your players? And it's really important to have a gauge of where you're at. You got to fill the the tank at times. Inevitably, you're going to drain it. And and also, we talked earlier about okay, there's ubiquitous media coverage of all these egregious examples. But you know, one of the things that I think is a salient point is that look at the successful coaches that are high profile: Doc Rivers, Lionel Hollins, Phil Jackson. They happen to be Brad Stevens at Butler. They happen to be PCA advi National Advisory Board members. However, Doc Rivers will talk about we want more R's than S's. We want more character than characters. We're gonna we're gonna pass on people with more talent because we want chemistry, and, and they're having great success. Michael Malone, the Kings' new coach, talked about the unbelievable commitment of the Golden State Warriors players to Mark Jackson, his belief in them. So again, our generation, they could, I think coaches could kind of dictate uh, a, a little bit more. The carrot and stick, now it's about appealing to the heart, minds, well, and souls of players. Let's talk about coaching for a second because we talk about the 70% uh, loss rate in terms of players by age of 13. I would suspect, at least having gone through the experience of being a youth coach, that the drop-off rate or the dropout rate of new coaches is probably pretty darn high as well because, <laughs> because I gotta tell you, by year three, I was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> when I do coaches clinics, I teach the coaches, because most of them are moms or dads, mm -hmm. and I tell them if you, you have to set boundaries for the parents and you have to set boundaries for your own child, and if you're if you want to talk about the game on the way home, you probably your boundaries are probably going to get crossed because you'll get mad at your kid or your kid will get mad. And I tell them, if you do these things, you will stay in the game. If you don't, you'll be done. And it's about year three that mm -hmm. they say, never mind, you know, I'm done. I think that never that some, again. Was never again. The word. <laughs> <laughs> never ever again. Mm. The um, the thing that I learned that I just went back out on the dirt and I learned that each kid has their own personality. So my playing days in the Pac-12 and coaching in the Pac-12, I feel like where you do, I'll tell you what to do and you do it that way. And now I had to learn the kids' personalities. And I was really shocked by that. I was like, wait a minute, I just told you to do something. And how I learned that was by their expression on their face. You know, the kid, mm. one kid would go, okay, I can do that. Another kid would just kind of shut down. So I've learned over the last year and a half how to really take each individual kid and try to motivate them in their own way and try not to go that extra step Right. that's going to shut them down, just take them to the rank where they can really learn something, get something done. And that's been a real challenge for me, because huh. it wasn't something that I had experience with. When I'm training an All-American, I just am training and teaching them their skill to get better. They go out on the field and they play a game and they're better, or they're not better, one or the other, and, and then they come back and they want to improve their skill again. In, yeah. our, fi in our final few moments, I, I wanted to ask you both, what, we've talked a lot about what's wrong Let's talk about what's right for a second. What are some of the events or developments that have happened over the past few years or that you see coming up in the near future that are the most hopeful in terms of really making the experience for young people better in youth sports and, and bringing down that rate? 
Yeah, I would say uh, locally, there are a lot of folks that are extremely committed, whether they're principals, administrators, athletic directors, coaches, that are really committed uh, to making this experience uh, as good as it can be for the kids. And, and particularly, again, leveraging the rife life lessons that athletics provide. Uh, locally, we have incredible support from our board, corporate partners, donors. We, we'll, it looks like we're going to double the number of workshops this fiscal year compared to last fiscal year. So there's a significant commitment uh, of people that, that really care uh, about kids. And to me, that, that's very motivational. And I think on a, on a you know, high profile level, we mentioned some of the coaches er, earlier that are, that are being successful. And again, if you're a coach, it's about what is going to be your legacy if you're a youth coach down the road. And, and so, Kelly, I want to give you the last word. What's happening in our last 15 seconds? What's positive that you see on the horizon? In the ground roots level, it's training that we're giving coaches and parents to be better coaches and parents to provide a good atmosphere for their kids. I feel like they have a lot of training now that they didn't have before. Coaches clinics, there's a lot of things that we do, and we're, we're working hands-on with the people that, are, that have uh, control of our kids. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you both Thank for you, being sir. on the show. And parents, clean up your acts. Let's make it fun for our kids. That's our show. Thanks to our guests, and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.